right, well, welcome everyone. I'm Anthony Hansen with the University of Minnesota. I'm an extension educator in field crops for integrated pest management. And today we'll be talking about alfalfa and specifically a bit about growth staging and also scouting for insects in alfalfa as well. So to start off, alfalfa is kind of a cornerstone crop in some of our crop rotations, especially if someone is a livestock producer. So this picture is just a picture from my family's farm where later in the fall, you might have corn where it was uh, taken for silage. You have a bare field, you have soybeans over on the right. And then the alfalfa is kind of the last thing that's green left out there for most of the year. So it's our thing that kind of breaks up some of our crops a bit over the years. And it can last for about two years for some high intensity uses or up to four to five years, depending on stand quality and the needs. So if you have beef cattle, for instance, you might be a little less picky about uh, the forage quality and you might be able to get more out of that field for multiple years. Whereas dairy or other high intensity uses, you might be looking closer to those two years. So overall alfalfa does improve soil fertility and it also works to help break pest cycles, which will talk a little bit about later when we get into insects too. And this can cover not just insects, but also weeds and diseases. So if you're mowing your fields or breaking up diseases or pathogens from other plants, say like soybean cyst nematode, you're making it so that field isn't as hospitable to some of these pests for a time if they're specific to a certain crop. So what we'll be going today is talking about alfalfa development, growth staging, and then also some specific insects and how to manage those in alfalfa. There are multiple insects uh, we can cover besides those, but we'll talk primarily about alfalfa weevil and potato leaf hopper. So to start off, alfalfa growth staging. There are a few different ways to approach this, but the most common way is using stage numbers and looking at different um, types of stages. So we'll start off with early vegetative, but then there's also early and late bud and then early and late flowering as well. So this is kind of the three main groups we'll be looking at. And over on the right of this table, you can see a few different uh, descriptions talking about uh, pretty specific things dealing with either stem length or whether you're seeing buds or flowers or potentially seed pods. So this table isn't the full list of stage numbers, but we'll be primarily gearing this towards a production alfalfa. And ideally you'll be mowing before you get to the point you're producing seeds. So we'll be just going up to about flowering. So the graphic on the right shows difference between buds, flowers, and potentially seed pods if you do get to that stage to help identify you know, what you're looking at. So if we're talking about bud, you'll see these flowers just starting to emerge, but they're not opening up quite yet. So a lot of this will be focusing on, again, that green box, early vegetative, and then a little bit into that early bud stage. So when we discuss forage quality, this again depends on what someone has in their operation for needs with livestock, especially. If we look at relative forage quality, that can be pretty low requirements if you're dealing with things like some horses, dry cows, and heifers at some points. But at the other end of the spectrum, we have production dairy cattle, especially in the first trimester, dairy calves. In the middle of the range, we have things like uh, feeder cattle, and some dairy, especially in those last 200 days. So depending on what you need, there can be quite a bit of variation in there. And that can play into both your agronomic needs, then also getting into pest management as well, uh, potentially. So the first question when it comes to agronomics and growth staging is when to cut, especially whether it's your first crop, getting your second, third, potentially even fourth. The first consideration is basically what kind of characteristics do you want in your yield? So first you can have forage yield, stem yield, and leaf yield. That's the total amount you're getting out of the crop. But there's also another factor in there that kind of competes with this overall yield and that's digestibility, or again, that relative uh, forage quality. So if you want high yield, overall that forage quality will go down if you wait until about that full flowering stage. If you want to cut very early, you may not get high yield, but you will get high forage quality at least. So there's the interplay between those two, again, depends on your operation and kind of what needs you have there. So a lot of times we're talking about either the bud stage or first flower, that's about where the two equal out to a degree. So you're optimizing both your forage digestibility and your overall yield. 
Also related to growth staging is root reserves. And this matters a lot, especially when we get towards the end of the season and you are looking at survivability of your alfalfa stand over the winter. You want those roots to have at least some reserves in them being able to grow and not being stressed constantly by mowing too early on. So when you look at overall in the growth stage, first you have growth initiation, but then you get about to six to eight inches of height. That's when you see the lowest amount of sugars or carbohydrates in those roots. So this is the point where the plant can be stressed potentially the most. Then once you get to about the bud stage again, full bloom, that's about the peak carbohydrates again. So those roots have quite a bit to work with. Then after that, obviously, they're going to be putting more into seed if it does go to that point. So that's how we can manage how healthy our alfalfa stands are by different growth stages and when we mow. So this leads into managing insects specifically. And we talked about the growth stages a bit and the health of the plant. But this can also affect when we decide if we're going to treat or use uh, other tactics like early mowing. So there are quite a few insects that actually do inhabit alfalfa. If you go out there compared to a soybean field or corn field, you'll oftentimes find a high diversity of insects. So for us entomologists, it's nice to go out into alfalfa fields and be able to find a high diversity of insects, at least for different pests to be able to take pictures of, like these cases. Not so great sometimes for production. But there's some variation in that too. Sometimes you get blister beetles for some pests, more pests on the horse end of things. And then you'll find other insects like alfalfa caterpillar that can rarely reach economic status as a pest. So there's a lot of variation in how much insects out there can actually cause damage to your alfalfa. And there could be other insects like variegated cutworm, plant bugs, pea aphids. We're not going to cover those today. We'll focus on two main pests early season when we talk about alfalfa weevil. And then later in the season is when potato leafhopper populations start to build up. And this helps illustrate the need for scouting and managing pests throughout the year, even for alfalfa, because sometimes we think about corn and soybeans, we're out there managing pests and being proactive, but we may not always think about alfalfa all the time. And sometimes the pests do catch us off guard when that happens. We talk about alfalfa integrated pest management, and we have other presentations talking about IPM and scouting, but just for a quick definition again for people, it's mainly our method to keep control methods compatible and reduce the risk from each of those. That especially applies to what we call some of our free tools that we have for farmers that we have to pay for insecticides, go and pay for application costs as well. But then we have some other tools out there that either can come with the plant or are actually other organisms out in the field helping us out. So one issue that has come up with alfalfa management recently is use of insurance insecticides. Going out and spraying ahead of time, thinking you might be able to get ahead of the pests. And maybe you're not out there scouting necessarily, or it might be after the fact when they've caused the damage and the insecticide is not necessarily helping anymore. So there are a few considerations when you're using insecticides in an IPM program. One is that a lot of our broad spectrum insecticides can kill beneficial insects. And we'll talk a little bit about those in one of our upcoming tests. This loss, what we call biological control, can cause other insect problems to flare up when normally they would have been controlled. So you can basically uh, cause issues with one of your tools and actually end up costing you more in the long run. And this overuse of insecticides can really to or can lead to insecticide resistant populations. So that's another issue, just one of our tools in a standalone issue is that you might be having insecticide that works well for multiple years, lose it, and you might be reducing your toolbox and either the number of insecticides you can use or whether you have any effective insecticides at all, which has happened in other cropping systems for other pests. And overall, we use IPM make sure we're avoiding these extra input costs when they're not needed at the time, especially if an insecticide isn't warranted quite yet, populations are low, then you don't need to spend the extra money because you're not getting a return on investment yet. And we look for that return on investment for each of these control methods we look at. So when we're scouting in alfalfa specifically, there aren't too many tools you'd actually need. The probably hardest thing to find, and it's still pretty easy to get if you 
go to different suppliers like Gemplers or BioQuip is just a 15 inch diameter sweep net. And we have that standardized that size, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Otherwise, shears, scissors, or anything to cut alfalfa plants for some sampling, a five gallon bucket, and possibly a hand lens too, if you want to get a better view of some of these really small insects. And one of those good examples of a small insect is alfalfa weevil. And this is an invasive beetle that was found over a hundred years ago in the United States, first found in Utah. And it is found across much of the Midwest, also West and over the East too. So it's pretty widespread as an alfalfa pest. And alfalfa weevil first shows up at least for what we see in May and June in most of the Midwest, you might see some in April as larvae. And these are from overwintering adults that have laid their eggs earlier in the year. And those larvae have developed their eating plant. But you can also see that in this case, this is a picture of one larva. You can often get a whole handful of these larvae by going to your dispine after you mowed if it's a high uh, density field and picking up a lot of beetle larvae off of that dispine. And it's not uncommon to get pictures like this. So during the whole period of kind of that May to June period, they are feeding. Once about June hits, those larvae develop into what we call pre -pupae. They're no longer eating. And it's kind of like a butterfly where they will have their metamorphosis. They'll go through pupae and then eventually to an adult. Now this adult beetle in about July, it might feed a little bit at first, but it goes into what we call basically estivation, a period of dormancy throughout the summer. So once those adults are out there later in July, there's no damage occurring at that point. And at that point, we are really not thinking about managing alfalfa weevil anymore. It's a one generation, a year pest. And after that, that's pretty much it for this pest. So we have a limited scope to look at this and look for damage. We can also save potentially by not going out and applying insecticide when they're no longer at the pest status or basically the feeding stage. There also have been some parasitic wasps released for a little bit more of a history on this. And they really came to prominence about the 1980s, 1990s, where it seemed like alfalfa weevil was being killed pretty well. But throughout the Midwest, we've had reports of sporadic outbreaks occurring. And there's been some concerns of whether these parasitic wasps are no longer controlling alfalfa weevil and trying to figure out reasons behind that. I'll talk a little bit about that at this uh, follow-up at the end here. So when it comes to actual feeding damage and symptoms, what happens is these larvae are feeding on the leaf tissue on the leaves, but they tend to leave behind the leaf veins. So you get what we call skeletonization. And over on the left, you can see pretty clearly it's just the leaf veins left after a little bit more severe feeding. Over on the right, we have a picture of some alfalfa, especially in the rightmost part of the picture, you can see a lot of the skeletonization and basically you see less stand, whereas over on the right, that's, those are pretty clean plants. So if you're going out in the field and you see this amount of damage ready, it's a little bit too late to do anything potentially, but again, it will depend on the growth stage of your plants and when you're going to be growing. And that gets into how we actually manage or control alfalfa weevil. One of the main considerations actually is mowing. When you think about you're going through with the mower, a lot of these insects, especially the soft-bodied ones, they may not survive that, but then they're also getting thrown between the windrows. And there's been a little bit of growth in this picture here already. But if you think about early on in the stubble, that's not a very hospital environment for these larvae. So that is one way we can actually kill off the larvae without needing to do any extra treatments going over the field, paying for applications of insecticides. One thing to keep in mind is these windrows can actually be a shelter for these though. So these larvae will continue to develop a little bit in that stubble under the windrows. So you do want to look under the windrows or try to uh, basically break up those windrows and bale quicker if you know you have a high infestation. The other option is insecticides. You can get into carbamates, organophosphates, and pyrethroids for a few of the common active ingredients in those lists. Those are commonly used for other insects too, so they should be pretty available. Be sure to check the labels on what is specifically labeled for alfalfa. So when we get into all these control tactics, when do we actually decide when to use them? And there's been quite a few studies out there looking at 
economic thresholds for alfalfa weevil, the defoliation weevil numbers, and basically yield reduction. So this graph shows just some data from early in the 1990s when there was a lot of work going on alfalfa weevil, that if you get about around 50% defoliation, you're getting close to 20% yield loss and just increasing from there. So these data inform what we use to decide for scouting thresholds of going out and scouting and deciding, are we at levels that we need to take action at? So to do that for alfalfa weevil, there are multiple ways to go scouting for it. And you can utilize your local extension websites. They often have uh, pre preferred methods for scouting in your state if there is some data suggesting that one method works better than another. One common method is first just to take a sweep net, not doing anything too scientific yet, we're just checking to see if the larvae are present. And at that point, if you do find some that are present that you think it is worth sampling further for, you can cut 30 plants across the field to ground level using those shears. And then you take that five gallon bucket I mentioned. So you rec record the height of each plant. This goes back to growth staging and those vegetative stages where we look at plant height and then shake that plant in a five gallon bucket just to knock all the larvae off and the, any other insects can show up in there too. So basically all you're recording is plant height and number of larvae per plant. Then you'll average that out as larvae per stem in the field. There are some recommendations is if you are at 16 inches or that near early bud stage, plan to mow early if you do find quite a few larvae anyways, because you are going to be hopefully mowing pretty soon anyways. So just speeding up that period of when you mow will help with pest management without needing to add too much extra work for you. And like I mentioned before, be sure to inspect that stubble for larvae after that first mowing. So I mentioned the economic thresholds. There are often many charts out there to help you gauge when you should be treating. So overall, first you have hay value for some producers. You may not always think about your hay value when you're feeding all of your hay and not buying it, but be sure to keep track of how much you really should value your hay at, because that helps inform when you should be treating. You know, it's always use the treatment costs of insecticide per acre as well in these charts. So you can split it out by, let's say if you're in the mid-vegetative mid stages, then you might be looking at treatment costs of $7 per acre or possibly less. And you can look at the first row in this chart and say, okay, if I have an average number of larvae of about one per stem, if you're drilling your hay at about $125 a ton, that's your threshold for deciding when to treat with insecticides. However, as you move down this chart, you can see you go to late vegetative, early bud, and then eventually if you get to a threshold of over 50% plants at the bud stage, it's more beneficial to the mold. So over on the right, there are a few more options we add in there for control options. Basically, if you're in the mid-vegetative stages, that's the point you could consider insecticides. But as you keep moving closer and closer from late vegetative, early bud, you're running into potential issues. One, some of those insecticides have a pre-harvest interval that is actually too long to be able to use for feeding to your cattle or other livestock. And in that case, you either want to try to use a short interval, pre-harvest interval insecticide, or you eventually reach the point where if you're at about early bud stage, mowing or cutting early is really your better option at that point. So there's an interplay going on there too. You have to judge based on the specific operation and what is needed there. So overall for alfalfa weevil management, first thing we want to rely on is mowing if possible. There is the considerations out there about insurance insecticide treatments, but in many cases, the mowing may already be taking care of those larvae in the field without that added cost and potentially the added cost of insecticide resistance popping up. And also keep in mind that after that first mowing, especially that generation is pretty much done. You're not going to be seeing more larvae in your second cutting, especially later on. So that's the point where it's better if there are weevils still left out there and they're not causing significant damage, just leave them be and worry about them for the next year. And you do need to consider if that insecticide will really pay for itself or not. Again, if you're going out there and mowing, that's already something you're doing. But then if you are early on in the process, maybe that insecticide does pay off for early vegetative stages if you have high numbers in the fields. And then keep those natural enemies in mind as well. 
they do help regulate those weevil populations. So if you aren't spraying insecticides, that helps keep those populations healthy and possibly to the point where you might be saving yourself multiple years in the long run of not having to treat. For the second pest, potato leafhopper, that one also shows up. It is not invasive to the U.S. It is native here, but it migrates up for a lot of us in the upper Midwest from the south and the Gulf of Mexico. So it arrives on storm fronts, essentially. So this time of year, you think about right now, a lot of us are getting a lot of rain. There could be insects riding up on those storm fronts, especially when they come from the south. This one is multi-generational, unlike alfalfa weevil. So populations build over the growing season instead. And basically, alfalfa weevil tends to be early season pests. The leafhopper builds up about mid to late summer when you really start seeing a leafhopper around. And that can be both immatures on this upper right picture or adults that have wings on them. So they're a bit more mobile when they're adults, obviously. They will lay eggs in the stems, but it's the feeding that causes significant damage. And you can especially spot potato leafhopper damage by what we call hopper burn. This is basically D-shaped yellowing or chlorosis. And eventually that will also turn into stunting if you have high population levels. This can be lethal with Fusarium root rot, transmitted by P. aphid, which I mentioned earlier. So you can have combinations of pests causing quite a few different issues for your alfalfa. And then you can find higher densities in field edges or near grassy weeds. And this can be especially stressful for your first year planting of alfalfa, especially if it's a pure stand of alfalfa and you don't have other uh, grasses or oats or potentially other cover crops in there. So for potato leafhopper, we do have a few control tactics. We don't talk about mowing as much for potato leafhopper because of how mobile they are. We can use resistant plants. And basically resistant plants in alfalfa have what we call glandular hairs. These are secretions that come from these hairs and they can basically stick to the potato leafhopper and cause it so that either they have trouble feeding or you might get to the point they actually die just from being stuck to the plant. And there's no yield in mod, yield drag in modern varieties from these resistant plants too. So that's a good consideration when you're considering putting in a new stand of alfalfa. I mentioned a little bit before, you can look at some grass mixes. Depends what you have in your mix of alfalfa. If you're using orchard grass or other grasses, that might help dilute out the effect of the leaf hopper too and give basically some protection that way. And then we can use the foliar insecticides similar to alfalfa weevil. Pyrethroids and organophosphates are the most common. So for potato leaf hopper scouting, we use those sweet nuts I mentioned before, but in this case, it is pretty standardized. What we'll do is we'll take 20 sweeps over five different locations. So that's gonna be five different locations, 20 sweeps at each of those locations. When we use that sweet net, one 180 degree swing is considered one sweep. So if you go back and forth, that will be two sweeps there. And then you wanna keep moving forward as you walk through the field using that sweep. Covering ground basically that you haven't covered before and make sure you don't have overlap. At that point, you're just gonna take the average number of potato leaf hoppers per sweep. And basically there's not too many restrictions on this aside from avoiding windy wet conditions where the insects will basically get stuck to the plant or your sweep net. And then also avoiding field edges where potato leaf hopper tends to congregate. For the economic thresholds for potato leafhopper, it's a somewhat similar schematic that we use for alfalfa weevil. In this case, I have it reduced just to plant height and then also cost insecticide treatment per acre. And there are other guides out there that add in the cost of your forage as well in terms of the overall value. So in this graphic here, if you have even just 0.2 potato leafhoppers per sweep at a low height and a low cost and sex side treatment, that is your threshold for treatment. But as you increase the height, that quickly increases up to about one potato leaf hopper on average. But I will point out, this is for the susceptible varieties. I mentioned the resistant varieties before. They actually can tolerate quite a few more potato leaf hoppers on there. And it's actually about to the point where it's about 10 times more potato leaf hoppers. And you don't see any difference in yield between these two numbers between let's say six potato leafhoppers on a resistant plant versus 0.6 on average for the susceptible ones. So that's one of the reasons why if you do see resistant varieties offered, 
consider that if it is uh, aligning with your other things you need in terms of yield or other forage quality that is in those genetics for that specific variety you're looking at. So overall, alfalfa IPM in the upper Midwest is something we're kind of having to revisit a little bit, partly because insecticide use is increasing. And we want to make sure we're using that judiciously to the point that we're using it at the correct time and not losing some of our tools there, whether it's insecticides or these natural enemies that we rely on. And that is kind of this recurring question, especially for alfalfa weevils showing up because it had been controlled so well for a while. Is it pesticide resistance that's occurring in alfalfa weevil itself, or is it the natural enemy populations that are having trouble? There's research going on in there, but that's what we want to keep an eye on both of these, especially. And I mentioned earlier before, but be sure to check those pre-harvest intervals on your insecticides for alfalfa, because it's a short interval between when you apply and harvest in many cases, especially compared to other field crops. And overall, this shows the need for why we use IPM, using scouting and only using your insecticides when necessary, both for potential environmental effects, but especially for those of us when we're looking at just the balancing the books for farming on our fields, is, is there a return on investment for what we're doing? Usually this scouting and selecting when insecticides should be used pays off in many cases. With that, I'll just leave folks with a few selected resources for guides on alfalfa management, whether it's staging or a few different insect pests to look at, as well as some of the other pests out there. With that, I thank everyone for uh, following along for talking about alfalfa today. With that, thank you. Mm -hmm.